no humans left in future Earth. Now the evolved version of honeybee filled the Earth. Will your honeybee tribes survive and thrive in apiary? Today we'll be teaching you how to play Apiary, game designed by Connie Fogelman and published by Stonelier Games. And hi everyone, Stella and Tarrant here from Meeple University. Now let's go to the classroom. In Apiary, players are tribes of futuristic honeybees, competing against each other to thrive in this post-apocalyptic space world. Players will use and manage their workers to explore the planets, gain resources, and to spend their resources to develop their hives with new tiles, all in the aim of gaining the most points. Players will manage the strengths and life cycles of their workers, strengthening them up and eventually sending them for hibernation. And once the hibernation comb is full, the player with the most points wins. I won't take you step by step through setup, but I'll show you what you'll have when you're done. You'll use a different side of the board depending on your player counts. The board is broken up into seven main areas, most of which represent one of the game's actions. There's the explore area, where the queen ship will go in search of new planets from this stack of planet tiles. There's the advanced section, where you'll have stacks and markets of all of the game's farm, recruit and development tiles, which you'll be building into your hives. The carve section has a limited and randomised supply of some of the game's carve tiles. And these are powerful endgame scoring objectives which players can fight for during the game. In the convert section you'll have all the components needed for teaching dances. And in research you'll have a shuffled face down deck of seed cards. Around the edges of the board are two different score tracks. The main score track where you'll track your victory points represented by the flower icon. Your starting position here will depend on your place in turn order. And note that some points are gained during the game, most are gained at the end. Along the bottom is the Queen's favour track, represented by the crown. All players begin at zero, and there are some endgame victory points depending on how far along this track you get. Each player will take a hive mat, a docking mat, and a faction tile placed so that this tile covers the faction tile space of the hive board. Starting resources are based on these brightly coloured icons. And starting workers are based on your faction tile and placed in the active pool of your docking mat. These worker pieces have four sides, ranging in number between one and four, and this number represents the current strength of the worker. It's important that you don't mix these up. Leave these workers on the sides they're intended to be on until you're required to adjust them. There are four workers of each colour, and any which aren't among your starting workers go into a common supply. You'll store all your other coloured pieces here, and your landing area begins empty. You're now ready to play. Apiary is played in turns, starting from the first player and going clockwise around the table. On your turn, you must take one of two possible options. Either place a worker, or retrieve all workers. To really understand this, we first need to understand one critical thing about our workers. There are four different strengths of workers. Workers of strengths 1, 2 and 3 get progressively stronger, but ultimately function much the same as each other. Workers of strength 4 have a number of special rules and powers which make them much more valuable than the other three. On your turn, if you place a worker, Choose any one worker from your active pool, place it on any legal action space, and resolve the main ability for that action in accordance with the strength of the worker. Every action has a special bonus action or ability associated specifically with the four strength worker. And if you took this action with your four strength worker, you would resolve the main action at strength of four and the bonus action in any order. The exception is at carve, where only a four strength worker may take the main action. These four strength actions are among the most powerful in the game, and you won't get very many of them, 
So it's important that you time them and plan them for maximum impact. Action spaces are never blocked by an opponent's worker. You can always bump another player's worker out of a space, returning it to that player to take that same action. And the strength of the worker doesn't matter. I can bump high strength workers with low strength workers and vice versa. Now to fully understand what happens to the bumped worker after being bumped, we first need to understand the second option on your turn, retrieving workers. When you retrieve workers, you must retrieve all of your workers which are currently not in your active pool, removing them from the board and resolving the following steps. Firstly, split all of your retrieved workers into the strength four workers and the rest. For each worker that is among the rest, you may activate the income from one different farm. Farms are these green colored tiles. And we'll learn a little bit later on how you build farms with the advanced action. But for this step, you'll be activating the incomes of different farms. The incomes are shown in this light green stripe at the top of the tile. So here, by retrieving two workers of strength one, two, or three, I would get to pick two of these three income benefits. After activating the farms, increase the strength of each of these workers one step and return it to your active pool. Strength four workers do not activate farms. Instead, this worker hibernates. Return the worker piece to the general supply, then take one of your hibernation tokens, place it into an empty slot in the hibernation comb and take any benefit that you cover. On the lower player count side of the board, this segment is used only at three players. Note that the comb is split into different segments and each segment will be evaluated separately for area majorities at the end of the game. You'll now continue with fewer workers until you resolve some sort of effect which allows you to gain a new worker, albeit at strength one. So now back to bumping. If another player bumps one of your workers and it was a strength one, two or three worker that was bumped, you have two choices. The first is that you can return the worker immediately to your active pool and increase its strength. This means you'll get your workers back more quickly without having to take multiple retrieve actions. However, this worker will not activate a farm while it's returning to your board. The other option is to leave the worker on its lower strength and place it into a slot in your landing area. Next time you take a retrieve action, in addition to getting back all your workers from the main board, you'll also get back your workers from the landing area, again, increasing their strength one step. But for this step, you do get to activate one of your farms with that worker. So in effect, you're making a choice between an extra retrieval or an extra farm income. If one of your strength four workers is bumped, then you don't have a choice. You hibernate the worker exactly as you would have if you'd retrieved it. The last thing we need to talk about before we can get into the actions is resources and storage. The game has five types of resources. Three basic resources, water, pollen, and fiber. And two advanced resources, wax and honey. During your turn, you have an unlimited capacity for resources that you gain, but at the end of your turn, you must store all of your resources in your hive, either on these spaces of your starting tile or on these spaces of any farms that you've built. All storage spaces are limited in the type of resource they can hold. So these ones can hold only water. These could hold a fiber or a pollen. This could hold any basic resource. These could hold wax or honey, and these could hold only honey. If you end your turn with any resources that you're unable to store, then you must discard them to the supply, and then gain one step on the queen's favor track for each discarded resource. This applies strictly to resources that you're forced to discard. You're not allowed to do this voluntarily. 
You can always rearrange your resources to create more space for other types, or even rearrange them to make it less efficient if you want to discard resources for the Queen's favour. So now that we have all of that critical background, let's have a look at the game's actions. The first main action is Explore, and this is the primary way of gaining basic resources in the game. This is the first of two actions to have these special double action spaces. Whenever you place a worker, you always place on the leftmost space. If there's a worker there when you place, you push it into the second slot. And if there are workers in both spaces, then you push the first to the second slot, and the one in the second slot is bumped. The strength of the main action is equal to the sum of the strengths of any workers in these two slots. So here it would be a strength 4 main action. You must move the shared queenship piece up to that many spaces orthogonally around the board. Here, for example, I've chosen to move three steps instead of four. And the queenship must finish on a different space to where it starts. If there is an exploration token there, take it, gain its bonus, and then place it in this slot of your docking mat. You'll probably never use it again, but it does combo with some other game components. Then if there's no discovered planet on this space, take the top tile from the planet deck and place it underneath the queen ship. If there are any empty squares on the planet, then fill one of them with a basic resource of your choice. This represents a discovery of that basic resource on that planet. Now gain one of each resource printed or placed on the top of that planet. This means that these planets get more powerful as the game goes on. On the next action, for example, the queen ship could move here, discover this planet, place water here, and then gain pollen and water. The next player could move back to Gentia, could choose to find even more pollen there, and gain two pollen. From that point forward, any player who visits Gentia will simply gain two pollen. Some planets have a four strength worker ability printed at the bottom, and if you took this action by placing a four strength worker, and be specific, you must place a four strength worker, it's not enough simply to have the sum of worker strengths be four, then you get to resolve the four strength ability in the destination where the queen ship lands. The second action is grow, and here you can spend basic resources to do some growth in your hive. There are two different main actions here, and you can do any combination of these actions up to a total strength value of the worker you placed. In this case, I could take this one strength action, or do the one strength action twice, or do the two strength action. The one strength action is to pay one pollen to gain a strength one worker. Take it from the general supply, if available, and add it to your active pool. The two strength action is to spend any two basic resources to buy a frame. Take a frame from the supply, all of these pieces are identical, and then place it onto your hive board anywhere adjacent to an existing coloured hex, like so. It is okay if this overhangs the edge of your player board. As we'll see, you can only build tiles into your hive on non-blacked hexes, and so building frames gives you more space for tiles in your hive. If you use your four strength worker to grow, then you can also upgrade your faction tile for free. Flip this piece over into the same orientation, and resolve any immediate effects that might be listed. It's more typical, however, for this to unlock a powerful endgame scoring objective. The third action is to research, and this will allow you to gain a seed card. As the main action, draw a number of seed cards from the deck equal to the strength of your worker, look at them, and then choose one to keep, and discard the rest. Newly gained seed cards go into your hand, and you may hold any number. There are three ways to use a seed card. The first is to simply discard it, to gain a basic resource of your choice. The second is to play it for its immediate action. 
You can do this on your turn either before or after your main action and you can play any number of these on a given turn. You'll then resolve whatever ability is shown there and discard the card. Your third option is to plant the seed and when you plant the seed you will unlock its end game victory point objective. However, you're not allowed to simply plant a seed without having another effect which allows you to do it. The four strength worker bonus ability at the research is the most reliable way to allow you to plant a seed from your hand. But there are some other ways to do it which you'll discover. To plant a seed, take the card from your hand and then slot it underneath an empty and available seed card slot. It's now there for the rest of the game, you can't discard or replace it. You begin the game with two open slots for seed cards and you can unlock a third or fourth slot the first and second times you place a frame into your hive. The convert action is a way to switch out the resources you've got for the resources you want and it's the most basic way of gaining the advanced resources of wax and honey. With this action you can perform a number of conversions, either the same or different conversions, up to the strength of the worker. The basic conversions are to discard a seed to draw another seed, swap one basic resource for another, give up pollen and fibre for wax, or give up two pollen and a water for honey. When you take this action with a strength 4 worker, then you may teach a dance dancing being the form of communication among bees. Choose any empty dance tile and then look through all of these tiles which are still available. What you can do is hunt through these to find the combination of conversion that you want to create. Say for example, I want a new way of making honey which favours me. I could, for example, make a new conversion which costs a queen's favour and a pollen to create a honey. Tiles you don't use go back in the stack. Then use this player cube which you would have had left over after setup to mark your dance. You may teach only one dance per game. From this point forward this is now available as another conversion option which all players may use. And remember that you can teach the dance before you do your conversions, meaning this is available to you from this turn. As an ongoing reward for teaching the dance, any time one of your opponents uses your dance, you gain one Queen's favour. The advance action is how you gain the three basic types of tiles into your hive. These are farms, recruits and developments. The action spaces in advance work the same way as the action spaces in explore meaning that when you place your worker, you'll place on the top slot. If there's a worker there, you'll push it to the second slot. And if both spaces are full, then the worker in the second slot is bumped. The strength of your main action is equal to the sum of the two workers present. And if there isn't a worker in the second slot, you get a plus one. The main action is to purchase a single tile from the market in the rows corresponding to your action slot and in the columns corresponding to the strength of your action. There is a single action slot corresponding to all three rows on the one to three player side of the board, while the farms are split from the recruits and developments on the four and five player side. The red player here with an action strength of three would be able to purchase any one of these four tiles. Pay the cost which is printed in this strip at the bottom of each of the tiles. Farms will cost fibre and water, recruits will cost pollen and developments will cost wax. Take the tile and build it permanently into an empty slot in your hive adjacent to at least one other previously placed tile. If you cover up a reward, then immediately claim that reward. And note that in some cases that reward could be a discount on the action you just took. We've already seen the benefits of farms. They'll give you space for storage and income when you retrieve. Recruits will give you some sort of ongoing passive ability, perhaps triggered by an effect in the game or taking a certain action. 
Developments all have an immediate once-off ability, and you'll resolve that now. Tiles are also worth a number of victory points, which are scored at the end of the game. Finally, slide all tiles as far to the left as you can, and replenish empty spaces from the top of the deck. If you take this action with a 4 strength worker, once again this means your 4 strength worker, not a total strength of 4, then gain a bonus 3 points. Note that with these icons, or some other effects on cards, you'll be able to sweep out and replenish a certain row of the advancement market. The final action is Carve, and this may be taken only with a Strength 4 worker. Choose any one carving tile from the display to build, and these will all cost some amount of honey. Take the tile, and build it in the same way as the advance action. These are all about unlocking a powerful endgame objective to score. Empty carving spaces on the board are not replenished. The game end can be triggered in one of two ways, either when the hibernation comb is completely full, or when a single player has placed all seven hibernation tokens. Each player, including the player who triggered the end, takes one more turn, and then you'll proceed to final scoring. Evaluate each section of the hibernation comb for majorities. Whoever has the most hibernating pieces there gains the gold number, and if applicable, second most gains the silver number. Tied positions are added up and divided, rounded down. So here, these two players would get two points each. Here, green would get seven, and these two players would get one each. And here, the 13 points are split three ways, so four points each. Score all of the points you've unlocked in and around your hive mat. That means all of the raw points on the left corners of each tile you've built, endgame objectives you've met on your carving tiles and faction tile, endgame objectives on any of your planted seeds, and points for filling up your hive mat and frames. If you cover every space that was originally available on your hive mat, you'll score 8 points. And for any frame that you've placed, if you cover all four of its spaces, that's also worth 8 points. Finally, gain the highest victory point value that you've reached or passed on the Queen's Favour track. The player with the highest score wins. If tied, whoever has the most active workers wins, that is, workers on their docking mat or on the main board. And if still tied, victory is shared. And that's how to play Apiary. Thanks so much for watching. Your like and comments are much appreciated. Subscribe to see what's coming and let us know what games you've been playing. See you next time.